In the last video, I gave you a crash course introduction to HTML and CSS. In this video, we're going to go over the way that CSS classifies the different HTML elements and some basic properties for laying out your content on a page and formatting your text. CSS divides HTML elements into two groups, block and inline. Block elements are things that need to take up their own space and shouldn't run into any other elements. For example, a section should be a unique block standing on its own. Headings are also block elements. And even paragraphs are blocks. Because even though they contain text that runs together, the paragraph itself as a whole is meant to occupy its own unique space on the page. Inline elements are the opposite. Anything that should by default run onto the same line as other elements and doesn't really need to be set apart. For example, a span of italicized text within a paragraph is an inline element. Links are also considered inline elements. You can change the way an element behaves by using the display property. For example, if you've got an element that would normally be treated as a block element, like a paragraph, you can set it to instead be treated as inline by adding a display inline declaration. Let's see how this works. Here I've got a heading and then three paragraphs of text. By applying a display inline declaration to all my paragraphs, you can see that they all ran together into a single block of text. Conversely, you can set an inline element to display block. So I'm going to set my link element to display block. And you can see that this link now jumped down, so it's occupying its own space on the line. The display inline block gives you the best of both worlds. The element will still behave as an inline element, but you'll be allowed to use some of the properties normally reserved for block elements, like margins, borders, and padding, as determined by the box model. The CSS box model determines how block elements should fill up the space that has been allotted for them. It defines the different spaces around each block element, and how the element's properties should fill those spaces. Each box is divided into four areas. The outermost edge is the margin area, which determines the amount of space that should exist between the element and its neighbors. Inside the margin area is the border area. This is the allotted space for adding a border around the element if you want one. Next is the padding area. The padding area determines how much space should be added between the border and the actual content of your element. This is like a buffer zone to let your content breathe a little bit. Finally, in the center of the box, you've got the content area, which is where the actual content of your element lives. Most rendering engines like browsers come with some built-in default values for the box areas around your elements. For example, they might have a larger margin value around a heading to add some extra space and help break up the content flow. But you can redefine your box properties however you want, and your definitions will override whatever built-in defaults your browser has. Let's take a look at another example. The properties to use for each area are pretty easy to remember. You've got margin for your margins, padding for the padding, and of course, border for the borders. To define margins and padding, you simply add a value to the property. I'm going to say 20 points. If you just add one number like I did, that will apply to all the edges of the box area. But you can also define each edge uniquely by adding four values, one for each edge. The top, the right, the bottom, and the left edge. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of my padding here, too. For borders, there are three components that you need to define. There's the border width, 
a border style, which determines what kind of line you should have. If you want a dotted line or a dashed line or just a solid border. And then the border color. You can also define each of these border properties separately if you want to. You can do border width, border style, and border color. You can fine tune your styling even further by defining all of these properties for just one edge. So I'm going to add just a bottom border to my paragraphs and give it the same definition. In the property name, you just specify which edge you want to define. You could change this to top, right, and you can sort of see it over here on the right or left. I'm going to stick with the bottom border. You can do the same thing with your margins and padding. So instead of defining all of your margins in one definition, you can define just one margin value. And all of the other margin values will stay at their default setting. Combining display values with margins, borders, and padding are your most basic tools for arranging your content on the page. Here's a more complicated piece of HTML content. I'm going to paste in some CSS that's going to transform this from a boring scroll of text into a slightly nicer design. You can see that I've set some elements to display in line. I'm using various margin declarations and borders and padding to turn that basic text into a more laid out and designed looking version of the page. Alright, so now we know how to lay out blocks of content, at least in a basic way. Let's talk about text. CSS gives you all the basic text formatting options that you'd expect to have, and we'll jump over to our coding window to review them. The most basic properties for manipulating your text are font size, font style, and font weight. Font size, as you might guess, changes the size of the text. You can specify your font sizes in pixels, inches, points, and even percentages of the default font size. Because our ultimate goal with these videos is to create a printed product, I'm going to use points, which are the standard unit of measurement for a text when you're working with print. For larger measurements, I might also use inches since I'm in the USA. But font sizes vary in such tiny increments that points just make more sense. Font style determines whether the text should be styled as italic or oblique, or just as regular Roman text. Font weight determines how heavy the text should be, if it should be bold or just normal. Generally with font weight, your only options are normal or bold, unless you add your own custom fonts that have some special font weight values like light or semi-bold, and we'll get into adding custom fonts in just a minute. Now, in addition to adjusting the text itself, you can also adjust the spacing around the text. For example, you can add extra space between each letter of your text, or you can add extra space between each line in a paragraph. The letter spacing property adjusts how much space is between the individual characters of your text. If you take a look at our paragraphs, I'm going to add some extra space by just specifying a small point value. That looks terrible. Line height adjust the space between the lines in a paragraph. Also called leading, 
This property can add some really subtle sophistication to your page. Another common property is text alignment. You can set your text to align to the left edge, which is the default value, to the right edge, or to justify so that both edges are even. This is a pretty common look for a lot of books. These basic properties give you the main tools to format your text, but you can take your text formatting even further by adding custom fonts. Using custom fonts is one of the most dramatic and popular ways to give your document a custom look. Fonts exist as files that live separately from your content. So the first thing you need to do is get a hold of the file for the font you want to use, including any variations you might want, like italics or bold and so on, which all typically live in separate files. You should also make sure that you have the right kind of license for any font you want to use. A lot of fonts have restrictions on how many devices you can install them on, so make sure you read the fine print when you buy your fonts. To use a font, you need to save it somewhere that the renderer can access it. This can be somewhere on the web if you're using a website, or somewhere on your computer if you're using a PDF processing program. For example, on my personal website, I've just created a folder for fonts next to my CSS folder, which is where I've stored all my font files. There are two steps to adding custom fonts to your CSS. First, you need to declare the font. This is a way of telling the renderer that the custom font file exists and how you'll be using it. A font declaration starts off like this, with the font face rule. Instead of a selector, you use this at font face rule to start the declaration, and inside you need to specify how you'll be referring to this custom font throughout the rest of your CSS. To do this, use the font family property and add a name for your font here. This can be any name that you make up, but you should make it something simple and descriptive. I'm going to be using a font family called Roboto, so I'm just going to go ahead and use that same font name, Roboto. You also need to specify where the renderer can find the font file it needs to use by using the source property. The value of the source property should start with URL and then parentheses. And then you put the path to the file inside your parentheses. If you were working on a computer with a PDF processor program, this might look like a file path like this. However, my font just lives on the web, so I'm going to go ahead and paste in the web URL. Then, to use that font, you apply the same font family value to whatever element you want to use your custom font in. I'm going to style all of my paragraphs so they use the Roboto font. You can see over here that the paragraph font changed from the default serif font to my custom Roboto font. There are a few other optional values you can add to your font declaration to say whether this variation of the font is italic, or just normal, as this one is, and to say whether the font weight should be bold or normal, or some value in between. By adding these extra properties in your font face rules, you can use the standard CSS text formatting properties like font weight and font style in the rest of your CSS, and you'll know that the renderer will use the correct font file for every variation. So, for example, in my document, I want to use the Roboto font family for most of my text. The Roboto family actually includes file variations for all the different kinds of font faces, regular, italic, bold, bold italic, and so on. So I need to add a font declaration for each of those font faces in my CSS.
I already had those written out, so I'm just going to go ahead and paste those declarations in here. You can see in all of these declarations that I've used the same font family name, Roboto, for each one. And then I've also added the font style and font weight declarations as appropriate. So in this declaration, I'm using the bold font face, and so I've specified a font weight of bold. Here I've got my italics, and here I've got my bold and italic font face. Now when I want to use those fonts, I can just use the same font family name throughout my document. And then apply the font style and font weight variations as I need them. By calling a font style of italic, I'm actually using a different font file the italic version of the Roboto font, instead of just manipulating the regular Roboto font so that it looks slanted. These basic layout and text formatting properties give us a good foundation for formatting our pages. In the next video, we'll get into how to actually set up a page versus just a scroll of text, and how to use the new Paged Media module from CSS3.